joining us now is Professor of Genetic Epidemiology and Statistical Genetics at the University of Edinburgh, Dr Paul McKeegee. And we have behavioural psychologist at UCL, a member of SAGE, Professor Susan Mitchie, and London restaurant owner Andy Jones, talking about the impact on business. And Dr Amir Khan is still with us, of course. So, look, who should we come to first of all? Um, I'm interested in talking to behavioural psychologist at UCL, a member of SAGE, Professor Susan Mitchie, because in this situation... Mickey, sorry, I've got your name wrong. Please don't ignore me because of that. I'm terrible at <laughs> no names. <problem>. Uh, <laughs> Professor Mickey, because in this situation, whatever the science says, whatever the rights and wrongs, it is how we behave in any type of lockdown, local or national, that surely must govern its effectiveness. You know, it's how we behave. So you've looked at how the nation behaved in the national lockdown you will have looked at how we've behaved as we've come out mm. of it and how individual lockdowns people have behaved and how it's worked what do you think the answer is what is the best way to get us to operate in a way that brings those figures down well the only way for us to get out of this pandemic is to um, have less contact between human beings because viruses jump from one person to another. In order to do that, we're going to have to restrict the contact between us far beyond what we've been doing uh, to date, which is what the scientific advisory group in emergencies advising government said one month ago. Now, now how do you get sorry, people not to, to interrupt adhere to you, that? Not to interrupt you, but yeah. does that work best in a national situation? or best in a focused local situation? Well, what we've seen with the local restrictions is um, a lot of confusion, where different regions are being asked to do different things. There's a lack of predictability. We don't know what's going to happen when in what regions. And there's a perceived unfairness in that uh, there's a bit of a north-south divide opening up, where people in the north feel they've been harder done by than under the national lockdown restrictions. In this situation, where you've got um, confusion, uncertainty, and also uh, perceived unfairness, all of those things will undermine adherence. So I think at this stage, we do need to move to what the Scientific Advisory Group in Emergencies recommended one month ago to a national circuit breaker of it would now, I think, have to be three weeks and should include schools, i.e. be over an extended half term. Dr Paul McKeegee, the, there are, I know you have very differing views actually to the ones we've just heard and there are two issues here aren't there? One is about how we deal with the virus long term until we get a vaccine and the other one is just about you know what we're seeing on the front of the papers this morning about hospitals starting to get very full and about us you know actually just managing our resources properly. A circuit breaker would help us manage the resources but long term you think that that is you know these circuit breakers are just sort of buying us more time and not really uh, a long-term solution until we get a vaccine. What do you tell us? What you really think? Well, the scientists who have developed the circuit breaker approach at Warwick University and London School of Hygiene are very clear that this is no more than a way to buy time. What they call a temporal reset of no more than a few weeks. It isn't a long-term solution, and it doesn't get us anywhere near an exit uh, from the problems we're in now. The strategy that those of us who've signed the Great Barrington Declaration have argued should be explored further is that we try to protect the vulnerable and then we would maybe have less need for these restrictions on the social activity of everybody else and we could in fact encourage social activity among the young and fit because the uh, once the epidemic in the young and fit burns out it will be safer for those who are, who are vulnerable. So while I'm not in any way trying to criticize those who are making local decisions about uh, local shutdowns now in the face of what of a new, new outbreaks, uh, it isn't a long-term uh, solution. There's also one a very specific worry about these on-off circuit breaker type interventions, which uh, some people in the infectious disease modeling world have commented on, which is that if we, these, by re disrupting and rewiring social networks by, for instance, closing pubs and closing gyms, then opening them again, we may even 
make matters worse by, uh, as it were, rewiring the networks through which infection is transmitted. Yeah. Um, I mean, Andy, you're trying to find a way through, keep your restaurant open. You've got mixed messages even from the experts. Um, what would be best for your business? Would, it, would, would you almost rather, in a way, having a full lockdown? Um, and No, you wouldn't. No. OK, what no. would be best for your business? OK, um, f for my business personally... I say let us trade. I say for the hospitality industry as a whole, let us trade. We have gone through every jump, every hoop. We've done everything that's been asked of us in the hospitality industry, and we're being blamed all the time. And it's just closed down restaurants, closed down bars. The 10 p.m. curfew has wiped out so many jobs. It's wiped off so much revenue from a lot of hospitality places. And, and when, when is this going to stop? When, when are we going to stop being blamed with everything that's happening? Now, when we opened on July the 4th, I didn't notice a spike in July. When customers were told well, by the Andy, government to eat just, out to help Andy, out, okay? Andy, I know you want to yeah. put your case, but, but yeah. let me tell you what people are saying about that. First of all, that it takes two weeks or longer. Um, okay, first of all, there is evidence, you're not being orders. blamed, but there is evidence that situations... Of the, the aim is to reduce where people intermingle, and unfortunately, and I feel so sorry for the hospitality industry, many of my friends work in it, but unfortunately yeah. the hospitality industry does operate in a situation where people need to mingle. But, but the hospitality industry is also one of the biggest employers in the UK yes. as well. If you, take, if you take London now, tier two... Our sales were down this weekend 35% from the weekend before on exactly the same wage costs. That is not sustainable to keep a business going. Now, Jones & Sons has other revenue streams. We do other things. So we hopefully should be OK. But if you are just a restaurant operation and you are on reduced takings with the same costs, the same rent, commercial landlords are not giving you any breaks, how do you expect hospitality mm. to survive? How do you expect people to pay their rent, their mortgages? People work for me that have children. How do they feed their kids? Now, I've said this a few times. The leadership from the start has been weak. It's been appalling from Boris Johnson all the way down. Now, the packages that we were given, the furlough schemes, that was for the workers. I'm talking about, you know, business owners in the hospitality of course. industry. They have to plan oh, ahead. Look, Dr. Amir so with us. This is the heartbreaking thing uh, about it all, isn't it? You know, the, the people are trying to save lives. People are trying to save livelihoods. Um, we've seen individual people suffering so badly and not necessarily directly from the virus, but of the impact of the virus. Uh, there was a, a, a actually rather lovely, in the end, tweet of the weekend, which caught everybody's imagination. Edmund O'Leary... Um, put out on his Twitter, he he's said... He's unemployed, that's the point, isn't it? He's, he's unemployed, unemployed lives alone. Yeah. he lives alone. He is, he is, you know, having to deal with lockdown in a, in, a, in a terrible situation. And he says, I'm not OK. Feeling rock bottom, please take a few seconds to mm -hmm. say hello if you see this tweet. Thank you. He was rather wonderfully inundated, absolutely undated, with some 100,000, I think it's gone up to hey, actually... 100,000 replies, 230,000 likes, which made all the difference to him. But there is a mental yeah. health issue, isn't there, as well, that we're dealing with, that people are having to cope with. I mean, taking all that into account and seeing the people that you do, uh, I mean, you know, what, what do you feel about the national lockdown? Do you feel that's something that is still necessary? Yeah, so uh, I can understand all the points of view here. I speak to patients. You know, Bradford itself has been in local restrictions since the end of July, and that's yeah. had a massive impact on uh, the restaurant services. I look after patients who work as, uh, in restaurants, in pubs, as taxi drivers. All of these businesses have been affected, and I'm talking non-stop to them about mental health, what support is available, and it, and it, is, it is stretched. In terms of being a doctor and, and a lockdown, I, I completely see why a, a circuit breaker is necessary. It does feel like we're stuck in a, a cycle of lockdowns and restrictions, lockdowns and restrictions. But, but I would echo what, what the experts are saying, really. If we are going to go into a circuit breaker lockdown, we need to make sure we use that time effectively to get test and trace up and running. We need results within 24 hours. We need 80% of contacts contacted 
and isolated. We need the public health messaging to be clear. And, and I would argue, really, that this has to be across a, all age groups. We can't just protect the vulnerable because the vulnerable don't live in isolation. They often have younger people going in and out of the households. We need all age groups to understand that nobody is immune from either the acute or the long-term effects of this, this virus. So if there is a uh, circuit breaker lockdown, and like I say, I do understand the mental health side of things, the financial side of things. I, I, I speak to people all the time there. But if there is, we need uh, a, a mission statement, at, really. You know, what is the purpose of this lockdown? It can't be just to get the numbers down because we've done that already and ended up back here. We need clear outcomes of what it is uh, supposed to achieve. Well, I'm, I'm sure this isn't, and Susan's nodding above you there, obviously, yeah. behaviourally. And, you know, we all understand your, your anger, Andy, because, you know, nobody wants, you know, your loved ones or your dear, you know, closest family to be out of work and feeling really down and desperate, not knowing how to pay their bills. That's, that's the worst that's sort of thing. But that's what's going to happen. Yeah, that's that is exactly what is happening. We, we totally agree with you, isn't it? Yeah. But this, in is why, can I say, this is why the government does need to have a good package of support mm. for everybody. Where's the money People coming from? Where's the money to give coming up their from? Life well, Andy Burnham seems to have fought for Greater exactly. Manchester, and I suppose perhaps he's setting a precedent there. This clearly isn't the only time we're going to have to talk about it, because until no. there is an announcement, we'll have to keep discussing the pros and cons of it. Thank you to all four of you for joining us this morning Thank and for you. all your differing views, and all valid, obviously, which is sort of highlights a jigsaw puzzle that is trying to, we're trying to Certainly. put together across the country.